Dr. Robert Jackson with the Institute for Classical Education, and I am here with Dr. Karen Taliaferro of Arizona State University. You're with Skettle. Skettle. That's the yes. School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. Mm -hmm. Our friends just down the road in Tempe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So we asked you, I asked you specifically to come and talk with us a little bit about some of your work. I think it stems out of your graduate studies, but you're really interested in some things that we have to learn from the medieval period. Right. Tell us a little bit about, just kind of give us a synopsis of what your, what the line is here that you've brought to the symposium this year. So why the medieval period yeah. is the question. You know, it's funny, I didn't come to it from the medieval period itself. I came right. to it because I started studying the history of Islam um, and Islamic thought. And because that was the period where Islamic philosophy, to some extent theology, though that was always sort of secondary, um, and, and the, the beginning of the legal sciences really, really flourished. So this was the period, if I wanted to understand the roots of right. Islamic law and philosophy, this was the period that I naturally was led to. Um, in doing that, I started to realize, oh, this is, this is the same stuff that I've been looking at for years, but you know, I hadn't been a, hadn't been a medieval focus in right. my studies prior to that. But to see the confluence of um, what is traditionally understood as Western medieval thought with Islamic, and to see that oh, these thinkers not only were borrowing, off, they weren't just commenting on Aristotle and Plato and a lot of the mm -hmm. same Hellenistic sources, they were talking to each other. You know, so Al-Farabi's teacher was a, a Christian, and they, they were both in Baghdad at the same time, you know. So um, it was, it, to discover this cosmopolitan period that turns out to overlap with what has been called the Dark Ages was just, it, it's a treasure trove. A so. lovely paradox, yeah. perhaps. Well, if it wasn't so dark after all, but as you, I mean, what, what was the prompt even to get you exploring the history of Islamic thought? Mm -hmm. There must be a little bit of a story behind that personally. There certainly is, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, in between my undergraduate and graduate studies, I did Peace Corps in Morocco. Um, I hadn't really come into it with a particular interest in Islam. I knew that that would be a part of my life while I was there. Sure. Um, it actually, it, it came down to, the most specific point was um, discussions with my friends and neighbors there in this you know, Berber village in the Atlas Mountains. I started to notice a pattern that um, the way that my friends were talking about religious knowledge was so different from the way that I had grown up talking about religious knowledge. It would usually be framed in terms of belief, so rather than knowledge. And I wanted to understand, you know, what what is what is the metaphysical world that they are occupying, right. in which knowledge can be in a, used in the same sense for mathematics as it can for divine revelation. So I started first looking into that question, and this led me into, yeah, I mean. What did, the, what did the early Islamic community, and then what did those Islamic thinkers that have been overlapping with the thinkers I was already familiar with, what did they think we could know, and why, on what grounds? You were attracted to that knowledge, mm -hmm. and the way they were able to articulate it, I yes. take it. Yes, yes, yeah. Do you think, or from your studies, do you believe that at some earlier time, as you're talking about those interlocutors mm -hmm. of the middle period, that such knowledge would have not only been accessible or, or held or possessed by uh, Muslims, but by perhaps Jews and Christians as well, at, at some earlier time? Is that your suspicion this here, is, or am I inferring too no, much? No, you are inferring the exact point of my current research, mm. so perhaps that's coming through. I want to understand um, for lack of a better way of putting this, sort of a, a medieval epistemology that I suspect but don't yet know was commonly held among Jewish, Christian, and Islamic philosophers, um, and that somehow split in the West such that we had scientific mathematical facts, right, and knowledge, and then we had metaphysical supposition and belief, and, you know, ne'er the twain shall meet. Right. And um, again, in my small Berber community, that split didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading more about medieval metaphysics in the West as well as in Islam, which of course overlapped with the West in a lot of ways, um, I'm realizing perhaps that is not a necessary either historical or philosophical split. 
there might be a, um, a broader conception of knowledge that can hold philosophically, right. um, but that we're not using. Right. So. Well, I'm just interested very practically in what some mm -hmm. of the characteristics or features of those Berber neighbors were, right? <laughs> I mean, as you described their, their ability to comprehend or to acknowledge religious uh, truths. Mm -hmm. What, what, how did that come across in those conversations? I'm, 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 could you give us an example, just so that I can get my mind around their okay. approach as contrasted, right, with a more, at least American, 21st century, knowledge is belief, it's your belief. Right, right, right. right. Um, Cri religious the knowledge. The clearest knowledge. example that I have in my mind is from a discussion, so I'd help to organize a conference with local like, development associations, okay. right? And the idea was, these were these are friends and colleagues of mine, sure. right? So very small scale, in the mountains, we're sitting outside for a tea break in a little garden. Um, and we had arranged for, a, we had one woman speaker. Um, this is, and, and you know, all of the other speakers are male. And somehow the conversation turned to the role of women in society. And they all turned to me, <laughs> I'm 23, I think at this point. <laughs> Karima, yeah, yeah. What, what's the role of women in America? And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and and how, is it different from here? What is it? Is it good? I'm like, this is, this is a large thing for me to speak to. Um, but the, the way that the conversation developed, I said, yes, um, women and men are considered equals. That doesn't mean that they always have the same conditions and sometimes they have different careers, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but the way that the conversation developed, one of my friends said, well, you know, we know from the Quran that women are supposed to be subservient to men. And, and here I want to stress that, you know, that is his interpretation. So here I am contesting sure, sure. his very conception of knowledge. But it wasn't the way that this would have been presented, you know, in an American setting would be, right. I believe from my faith. Or um, the Bible says this and I believe it. But this was, no, we all know this. And so what can we do given this knowledge? Um, and it wasn't exactly a contentious discussion. They actually were seeking, you know, what can we do to advance women in our society given what we know? Mm -hmm. um, and this was, I think, one of, the, one of the conversations that really got me thinking about, well, what, what is it that we know and what is it that we believe? And are we sometimes conflating them on both sides, perhaps? Mm -hmm. On both sides, yeah. perhaps. Well, it has been a pleasure to have you at our symposium this year. I'm hoping we're going to get more opportunities to talk a little bit more in the future about that cosmopolitan era, as yes. you described it, <laughs> yes. which we probably could learn a few things from. I hope so. I'm we hope so. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you.